this is Dr. Michael Timms. I'm the academic director for the HERB program at Maryland University of Integrative Health. And uh, this school started over 40 years ago as a acupuncture school. And the HERB program was um, started in 2002. It was the second big program. And uh, we have a master's in therapeutic herbalism. And the origin of that program was really focused on clinicians as an endpoint. And we still have a program that trains clinicians. Um, and we have a second program. So this second area of concentration focuses on people who want to get into the herbal supplement industry as entrepreneurs or as researchers, educators, or with herbal supplement companies. My name is Nicole Rubin. I'm the manager here at the Herbal Dispensary at MUIH, or Maryland University of Integrative Health. Here we compound formulas for clients of our alumni and students. So our alumni graduate the herbal clinical program and then they go out and um, you know, start their own practices. And at that time, they will send us formulas by email, fax, or by phone. And um, once we get those formulas, we prepare them, um, contact the clients ourselves, and then we actually blend up the formulas. We also do tincture making. So we have five tinctures that we currently make in-house. We have a certain procedure that we follow in order to make it a one to five ratio. And that is a procedure you'll be seeing later on. Um, you'll be able to be a part of that process in case you wanna create that in your own business model. So a tincture is basically an extract of plant material um, or plant constituents, which are uh, the chemistry inside a plant that we would consider to be medicinal. And you extract that with uh, different types of solvents. Um, even a tea is considered an extract, but in this case we would be looking at an alcohol and water extract. And sometimes you could use uh, glycerin and water as well. So. Um, each of those would be considered a tincture. We usually call the alcohol extract a tincture and we call the glycerin extract uh, a glycerite. Mm -hmm. So we have um, three different things here that you might tincture. We have licorice mm -hmm. root today and I think we have skull cap for our leaf. Yeah. And then we also have elderflowers. I'm sure everybody's heard of elderberry, elderberry wine or elderberry syrup. We also use the flowers medicinally. And each of these could be tinctured. And so you might ask, why would we tincture the flowers instead of the berries uh, here? And that's a pretty good question. And the answer is pretty simple. It's that we, we think that there are sort of some different properties in the flowers than in the berries that might be more important for supporting different functions. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Nikki? Definitely. Mm -hmm. And then also the different type of plant that you're going to be tincturing is going to affect the ratio of water to alcohol. And so with the root, you're going to have a different ratio of alcohol to water. More water in a leaf than the root is something to think about. And then also if you have just harvested these plants and they're still kind of green and uh, they have a lot of water in them already, you have to sort of adjust for that as well. All of our extractions here are one to five ratios. Um, so even when we have our St. John's wort flour that we work with, um, it's still gonna be the same ratio here. Um, and then I also wanted to bring up that in this case, we are doing a specific tincture for um, resale. And so we are using our tinctures in the formulations we make for clients. So in this case, we're trying to be as particular as possible about the ratio and the, um, the amount of water to alcohol. But if you're doing this in your community or for your family or your home and you feel a little bit more relaxed about it, there is also a folk method. You know, you don't have to measure as seriously and as exactly as we are going to be in this situation. A one in five tincture ratio would basically be a weight of herb to volume of minstrum. And minstrum is just another word for the solvent. So in this case, we're gonna use an alcohol and water solvent. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll be showing the measurements of doing that. And today we're gonna be demonstrating that with a root extraction. 
and we're going to be using ashwagandha, which is uh, not a forest plant, um, but it is a root plant, like a lot of forest plants that you would be growing. And the reason we're doing that one is just because it's kind of the next thing to be processed yes. here in the MUIH herbal mm -hmm. dispensary. So you'll get to see a root um, extraction process today. Yeah, and ashwagandha is an adaptogenic herb, so it's going to help your body adapt to stress long term. Um, there's lots of other amazing benefits of ashwagandha um, on the system. It's very restorative, it's beneficial for the liver, um, so you can also uh, do some research on that, but the ashwagandha has tons of articles and lots of research out there about its benefits um, just on the overall system. And interestingly, one of the plants that you might have learned about or know a lot about, American ginseng, is also considered an adaptogen. So it certainly does have a lot of similar uses, though there are some differences with that plant. But it would also be a root extraction. So um, if you were going to, to tincture an American ginseng root, you might do it in the same way that you, we do with ashwagandha today. Okay, so we're going to get started uh, with the tincture, but while we're getting started, while I'm just getting, uh, opening our, our bag of uh, ashwagandha roots here, I wanted to talk a little bit about when you might harvest. So roots uh, are traditionally harvested in the fall, about the time that the, the foliage is starting to die back on the plant. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One of the biggest ones is that you want to ensure potency of the herb um, so that you can make sure you have sort of the, the highest quantity or the, the maximum amount of what you would consider to be the active um, constituents to be in um, the part of the plant that you're going to use as medicine. And so if you think about it even from an energetic standpoint, um, in the fall, well, if you think about it in the spring, you know, where's all the energy in the plant in the spring? You know, it's kind of in the flowers and in the leaves and it's all bursting up out of the earth. But in the, in the fall, it's all kind of dying back down. So all of the energy is going back into the, the roots of the plant. And so that's the time when the roots of the plant would be at their most potent. Sometimes roots are also harvested in very early spring. Um, so that's another time that can happen, but most often it happens in the fall. Um, and there are a couple of other reasons that you might want to wait for um, the plant to be dying back to harvest it. And one of the big ones is conservation. Um, for instance, with ginseng, uh, where we, we really have an issue with conservation, we, um, we want to make sure that we're not kind of over harvesting those plants, you want to make sure that they're mature enough and that they've produced the seeds that they're going to produce for that year um, that can then be replanted before you take the root because of course when you do a root harvest you kill the plant. It's not the same thing as um, with elderberry where you might just take sort of the, the berries or the flowers off of the plant and it can continue to grow. Um, so that's always something to think about as well when you're doing a root harvest. And then and then also that, that maturity part is really important for potency as well. So there have been a few studies that show that if you harvest plants when they're too young, usually younger than reproductive age, then they don't necessarily have the same quantity of the active constituents as they would when they're a little bit older. So the rule of thumb is really for them to be of reproductive age when you um, harvest them. So this would have been a plant of reproductive age, and it would have been harvested in the fall to ensure potency, and that's what we're going to be using today for our tincture. So Nikki's going to take us through the process of tincturing. So for this tincture, we're going to be using 460 grams of the ashwagandha. So I'm going to measure that out here on our scale. So I'm 
actually going to begin to grind up the ashwagandha. Even though we have 300 grams, the scale is getting pretty full here on the boat. So we're gonna start the grinding process and then we're gonna continue weighing. So one reason we don't want to make it too powdered is because when we're filtering it, if there is a lot of powder in the tincture, it's going to actually clog up our filters. So we actually use a coarse powder, which allows us to get the maximum surface area, but at the same time allows us a smooth filtration process. It does take a little while, but really at the end, you'll have a beautiful product, and that's the most important thing. So now that I've measured and ground up the ashwagandha, I'm going to put it in this gallon jar, and that's gonna put it in there so that when we add the alcohol and the water, this is where it's going to stay. It's gonna stay in here for a week. Some people like to let it sit for longer, sometimes even a month, but in this case, we let it sit for a week um, since there are studies that have shown that within the first couple hours, a lot of the constituents actually get pulled out. So you're gonna see lots of different uh, things on that in terms of the amount of time you should let it sit. In this case, we're preparing it to add the water and the alcohol, and then it will sit for a week in our flammable cabinet where it will macerate and we will stir it and uh, mix it daily. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add the distilled water to the graduated cylinder here. We want to add 1,021 milliliters. Um, and then the next thing I will do is I'll measure out the alcohol separately and then I'll add it to the water and stir it. And then I'm going to add it to the total of our ashwagandha root that we've already ground. And now I'm going to stir it for a few moments before I let it sit for a week. And you can already see the color changing and the constituents beginning to be pulled out. So now that we're done processing the tincture, we're going to put a label on it and then we're going to put it in our flammable cabinet away from the light. So as you can see with all of our jars in the entire dispensary, they're all amber and that's gonna protect them from the light. So even our tinctures below, you're able to see they're all amber uh, bottles as well. And since this, we don't have an amber bottle this large, we actually are going to store it away from the light in a, our tincture cabinet. Um, which is uh, flammable protected. So we've waited a week. Our tincture is macerated. We've shaken it every day. And now that we have taped on the tube, which is gonna strain all the liquid out into the silver bowl, we're going to begin spooning it into the tincture press. Okay, I usually like to move it forward a little bit just to make sure I don't spill any of it. So the initial portions will come out easily with the liquid, and then we're gonna spoon out the remaining portions with our silver sanitized spoon. already coming out the bottom of the tincture press. So now that we have everything set up, we're going to go ahead and start pressing the herb. Basically, I'm 
I'm pressing as much as I possibly can in my own strength. And now that it's at the bottom, I can't move it any longer. Now I'm gonna put the hydraulic on. So first I'm tightening it. Okay. And the liquid is really coming out now. So this is the first stage of the filtration process. You can see that there's a strainer with one coffee filter on top, and this will go through. Once the, this is beginning to fill, then we put it through the next stage of the filtration process, which is the ceramic funnel with the Wattman paper inside. So now that you've finished the first stage of filtration, you have your last stage. So here is the ceramic funnel with the five, number five Wattman paper. And then we have our tincture that was filtered from the first stage of filtration. So I'm gonna pour it in here. So we're gonna let it go ahead and percolate and when that is finished, we'll bottle it up at the end. So now that we've uh, filtered our last stage, I'm going to pour it into the graduated cylinder for ease of use. And from there, it's going to go in our amber bottle to go on the shelf. So now that your bottle is full, you wanna make sure that you have a proper label that indicates everything that you've just done. So we have our label for the ashwagandha with the Latin name, the percentage of alcohol to water, and our ratio of herb to menstruum ratio. And then we also have suggested use on there. So it is very important to make sure that you put the date on your tincture bottle and also a lot number. Um, for us, it's very important, especially working in industry and selling our products, to be sure that our lot number reflects the batch that we just created. So it's a unique lot number. And that's mostly so that we could trace it back where anything to happen um, regarding that specific tincture. We're able to see where it came from. We also have, um, different logs where we log in when we began a tincture, when we started macerating it, as well as the time that we strained it and bottled it. So it's really good to at least at the minimum keep a um, detailed list of when you started um, macerating your tincture. That way you know when to press it and also that way you're able to um, locate it if you have any issues that you want to go back to that tincture you're able to say oh this is the tincture i made on 3 8 16. so those are a, a couple of our quality control practices um, we have quite a few here in the dispensary but those are just a couple related to our tincturing processes